Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In week 6 of this course, we will study about the concept of externalities in some detail. Although you have been introduced to the concept of externalities while doing economics of health by looking at issues for example, information asymmetry and market failures and so on. But in this module, we will take up the issue of market failures and externalities in some detail. Now, students by now you know that health and education are two unique economic goods that requires the intervention of the government. Uh, when we studied private returns to education and uh, changing elasticities of demand for health, we realized that health and education apart from being public goods are also can also be private goods. Uh, we also studied in one of the classes that the health and education sectors cannot be entirely guided by a, a profit motive. Now, under these circumstances, it then becomes essential for the governments to uh, intervene. Now, uh, public economics is a distinct branch of economics that extensively deals with the issues of public sector intervention or government intervention and how economists have come to understand the distinction between public goods and private goods. An adequate distinction between public goods and private goods is essential because it enables policy makers to determine what is the optimal mix of goods that needs to be produced, what is the optimal production of goods and services and also how it needs to be allocated and uh, distributed. It is in this context that uh, the uh, framework of how public sector enterprises uh, carry out intervention in the economy and the framework of the distinction between public goods and private goods is important for the study of economics of health and education and we will try and see later how to use some of these concepts in understanding interventions that the governments make in the uh, sectors of health and education. So, in this lesson I have planned to introduce the learners to two basic questions. One is what are the budgetary functions of a fiscal policy and second how do we distinguish between public good and private good. So, this lesson will be in two parts. In the first part we will study about the public sector or uh, what does it mean when we say that the public sector needs to intervene in the economy and what are the important uh, things to keep in mind when we talk about fiscal policy or the budgetary functions of a fiscal policy. And uh, in the second part, uh, we will talk about the distinction, the economic distinction between public goods and private goods and what is the rationale for understanding the dichotomy between public goods and private goods. So, what is this public sector? Mostly it is the government whether it is the central government or the state governments or the local governments, mostly the public sector refers to the government or something which is largely handled by the government. Now, there is a normative view and a positivist view with regard to the uh, intervention of the government in the economy. From a normative point of view, a public sector is required as it reflects the presence of political and social ideologies which depart from the premises of consumer choice in the context of market economics. Because there are different kinds of economies across the world, there are democracies and there are monarchies and so on and so forth. So, given the kind of social uh, goals or social objectives that are in place and given the different sections of population that we deal with, given the diversity that exists in our population, it often becomes a normative question as to what should be the intervention of the public sector and what should be made available to whom at what cost. And it is important to understand here also that the market mechanism alone cannot perform all economic functions and public policy therefore is needed to guide, correct and supplement market mechanisms. In fact, we say in economics that the proper size of the public sector, when we say the size of the public sector meaning that how much of goods and services should be provided by the government or through government's budgetary processes is to a large extent or a significant degree a technical matter rather than an ideological one because it is given per se that all goods and services cannot be provided through the market mechanism because market fails in these kinds of uh, uh, processes and therefore the governments need to step in. And some of the reasons as to why uh, markets fail uh, you have been introduced to for example, the presence of externalities. We although we understand the basic idea of what externalities are in this module we will get into some details of the economics 
of uh, uh, the economic concepts surrounding e externalities. Information asymmetry, there are also issues about equity and social justice because often the markets might intervene without, when markets provide goods and services, uh, it cannot be determined uh, whether it is being equitably, it is equitably reaching all sections of the population or not and therefore, due to matters of equity and social justice, then it becomes important to guide the allocation of resources. And this is all the more important in the context of social goods and services or public goods and services such as education and health. Similarly, there are various kinds of stabilization policies that need to be invoked to be able to ensure how much of public sector intervention is required. So, therefore, we often say that it is not whether or not there should be a public sector which is debatable, but by how much the public sector should intervene or by how much the government should intervene is the matter of concern here. Now, government regulations may be needed to secure many conditions. What are these conditions? There is a claim that market mechanism leads to efficient resource uses and often perfectly competitive markets actually do not exist or operate and therefore, it makes it necessary for the public sector or governments to regulate. We have seen it in the case of economics of health that there may be different kinds of information asymmetries uh, or maybe uh, adverse selection or moral hazard which may require government intervention to a large extent and also the fact that information losses or uh, imperfect competition prevails in the market may lead to a situation where the uh, goods and services may not reach the sections of population that desire the most. And therefore, the claim that market mechanism leads to efficient resource use may not be uh, accurate that would and therefore, it has to be uh, it has to be complemented by some kind of government intervention. Secondly, uh, the public sector may be needed when competition is inefficient due to decreasing costs. I will uh, in the next in one of the slides explain what is this uh, concept of inefficiencies in competition because of decreasing costs it arises mostly in the case of natural monopolies. Thirdly, the contractual arrangements and exchanges needed for market operation cannot exist without protection and enforcement of a governmentally provided legal structure. Uh, any uh, market economy which carries out uh, businesses uh, with the dominance of private players, uh, there has to be regulations in place, there has to be legally sanctioned regulations in place for businesses to be carried out appropriately and it is more so important in the case of uh, health and education for example, which has very clear cut social objectives and uh, needs government regulations so that uh, the customers or the consumers are not adversely impacted. Uh, fourth is that there are problems of externalities and market failure and therefore, it requires correction by the public sector. Often we say that when there is market failure or when there are externalities, huge positive and negative externalities, some kind of government intervention is required. But of course, in the uh, branch of public economics, there is a large literature which points to various other kinds of instruments that can also be brought into place or um, brought into force to be able to deal with market failures and externalities. But for the sake of our course on economics of health and education, we will largely stick to government intervention as some kind of a response to market failure. Similarly, social values may require adjustments in the distribution of income and wealth which results from the market system. Um, we have seen amply that uh, income inequality for example or increase in incomes does not necessarily lead to equitable distribution of resources and uh, under circumstances where there is inequality or very uh, very large levels of intense inequality conditions within the economy, it might require some distribution of income and wealth which of course cannot happen with the help of the market mechanism and the governments must step in through various kinds of government policies. Uh, finally, public and private points of view on the rate of discount used in valuation of future uh, consumption may be very different. I will explain this point in some detail in this uh, uh, slide here. So, what do we mean when we say that the discounted value of consumption 
may be different from a public sector perspective and a private sector perspective. Now, the public sector often uses a lower discount rate when valuing future consumption. This is because governments typically have a longer term perspective and focus on social welfare, sustainability and intergenerational equity. And they place a very high value on future benefits and costs which can lead to more long term investments projects like infrastructure, education and environmental protection. And because they are interested in, uh, they have a long term view of overall development of different sections of the population. So, it might include uh, very long term investments like for example, social sector investments. On the contrary, the private sector which includes individuals and businesses usually apply a very higher discount rate because they are more concerned about the opportunity cost of uh, resources foregone during the current period because of investing in long term projects. So, uh, they focus on opportunity cost of capital, the uncertainty of future returns and the preference for immediate consumption or investment returns and therefore, often private entities prioritize short term gains and may undervalue long term benefits or costs which is why uh, the private sector perspective could be to bring down short term social sector uh, investments uh, that may have long term uh, benefits, but because of the opportunity cost of capital being employed there, they may want to look down upon uh, long term investments in the social sector. And this leads to a difference in the discount that is on the discount rate that is imposed on consumption in the current period. So, what are the implications of this differences in public sector perspective and the private sector perspective? There are at least three implications. One is with respect to policy decisions. Now, when there are differences in discount rates, it can lead to divergent policy and investment decisions. For example, a government might invest in a long term infrastructure project that has significant uh, social benefits, while private investors may want to avoid it due to the high initial costs and the delayed returns. Similarly, second is intergenerational equity. This leads from the first point, a lower discount rate used by the public sector can help ensure that future generations are considered in today's decisions and thereby promoting sustainability and equitability considerations. But the private sector on the other hand uh, may want to employ a higher discount rate. It might lead to decisions that prioritize immediate benefits at the expense of future generations. Third point implication is with regard to cost benefit analysis. The choice of a discount rate affects the cost benefit analysis outcomes. Usually public projects appear more beneficial with a lower discount rate justifying investments in public goods and services, but private projects require higher returns to be deemed worthwhile investments. So, therefore, the emphasis or the priority uh, with regard to the focus of the public sector and the private sector is uh, mostly related to the opportunity cost of capital being employed today in the different kinds of projects and investments. And uh, therefore, uh, the kind of good that we are talking about, the social implications of the good, whether we are considering uh, which is why we have had very elaborate discussions on the issue of human capital and its relationship to economic growth. So, uh, uh, the government of the day might uh, feel based upon the uh, justice and equity considerations feel that our emphasis on education and health today might lead to long term benefits and therefore, want to improve basic education facilities or secondary education facilities and so on. Whereas, the private sector perspective may require investments on some other projects. Now, uh, I mentioned about natural monopolies. Uh, we mentioned that there may be a need when competition, the public sector may be needed when competition is inefficient because of decreasing costs. Now, this refers to natural monopolies. So, what are natural monopolies? A natural monopoly basically occurs in an industry where a single firm can produce goods or services at a lower cost than any potential competitor due to significant economies of scale. And what does this mean? This means that the average cost of production decreases as the firm increases its output. And natural monopolies often arise in industries with very high fixed costs and low marginal costs making it inefficient for multiple firms to operate. Therefore, very heavy industries for example, public utilities, railways etc are uh, more or less uh, very close to the concept of natural monopolies which requires uh, in most countries there is a heavy intervention of the government in these sectors. So, what are the characteristics of natural monopolies? Mainly three, one is very 
very high fixed costs. This industry requires substantial investments in infrastructure or capital, making entry and competition costly and inefficient and therefore it discourages the private players to enter into uh, these industries. Second is large economies of scale. The average costs decrease as the scale of production increases, which means that a single firm can supply the entire market at a lower cost per unit than multiple firms. Finally, non-rivalrous consumption. In some cases, the good or service provided does not diminish in availability as more people use it, which complements the economies of scale. I will um, uh, elaborate upon this concept of non-rivalrous consumption when we come to the second part of this lesson on public good, private good dichotomy. So, uh, there are three uh, major characteristics of natural monopolies which makes it uh, sufficient for uh, government intervention, high fixed costs, economies of scale and non-rivalrous consumption. Now, what are the examples of natural monopolies? There may be utilities such as electricity supply, water supply, natural gas. For example, um, in the case of electricity supply, the infrastructure required to generate and distribute electricity involves substantial capital investment in power plants, transmission lines, distribution networks, etc. And therefore, it is more efficient for a single company to manage this infrastructure than for many private companies to build and maintain parallel systems. Similarly, water supply, uh, building and maintaining water treatment facilities, pipelines and distribution systems have very high fixed costs. Uh, so, therefore, a single provider can achieve lower average cost by serving the entire market. Natural gas, similar to electricity and water, infrastructure for extracting, transporting and distributing natural gas involves significant fixed costs, making it more efficient for one provider to supply the market. I have taken the example of railways, the construction and maintenance of railway tracks, stations and signaling systems involve substantial capital investments and it is more efficient or conducive for a single railway company to manage the network than for multiple companies to build competing tracks and infrastructure. In the context of India, for example, it is the Indian railways or there is a massive government intervention in the Indian railways to be able to ensure. Uh, this. The conditions are conducive for the governments to intervene or the public sector to intervene. Similarly, telecommunications in many contexts, uh, the local telephone services, the infrastructure required for local telephone services including telephone lines, exchanges and switching equipment represents very high fixed costs and historically this has led to natural monopolies in local telecommunication services although because of technological advancements that have been entry of the private sector as well. So, what we have seen is, uh, you know, what is a public sector, what is the importance of a public sector, why we talk about public sector intervention in the context of provision of goods and services and these are some of the reasons why government regulations may become uh, very uh, important. Now, while we are discussing the importance of government uh, intervention, it is also important to point out that if we argue that the limitations of the market mechanism calls for corrective or compensating measures of public policy, uh, that does not prove that any policy measure which is undertaken will in fact improve the performance of the economic system, meaning to say that it is not that all inefficiencies are only on the side of the market and the governments will not uh, err or governments will not fail. So, there are government failures as well and uh, public policy uh, no less than private policy can be inefficient and therefore, the basic purpose of studying the economics of public sector is to explore how the effectiveness of policy formulation and application can be improved. It is not to negate the importance of the private sector or to give more primacy to the importance of the public sector. But in mixed economies such as ours where there are diverse issues, there are diverse populations that require different kinds of attentions within the Indian economy, it requires a, a mixed kind of an intervention where there are markets that requires the uh, operation of uh, market mechanism and there are uh, sectors or there are um, uh, products, goods and services that needs uh, the uh, intervention of the government. Uh, when we say the public sector, this is what we refer to public sector in economics. Now, when there is a public sector that uh, faces operational challenges because of market inefficiencies, 
then there has to be a separate process that brings into operationalization the budgetary policy. Now, this is what is referred to as the political process of provision of goods and services. In the context of uh, social goods and services such as health and economics, because we understand that there are market inefficiencies and there are market failures, therefore, provision of goods and services, provision of health and education has to happen through the political process of voting. We, uh, depending upon the kind of democracies that we live in, whether it is a parliamentary democracy, for example, there are multi party systems, different political parties have different agendas, we vote different political par parties to power depending upon their economic and social agendas and so this is the voting process through which we choose our governments so that budgetary policy can then have dominance in our lives in terms of the provision of goods and services. So it is in this context that the public sector or government intervention is connected to this process of budgetary policy. In economics, we refer to two important policy instruments, monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy mostly refers to the rates of interest that is decided within the economy, which is within the purview of the central bank. And then we refer to fiscal policy, which mostly considers tax and expenditure policies that are carried out by the governments of the day. So, it is a political process, budgetary policy is often a political process because it is people's voting preferences that decide what is the kind of budgetary policy that needs to be in place. But here we will first understand what are the major functions of a budget policy, why it is important to discuss budget policy and the functions of budget policy and ultimately in the next class we will try and integrate this budgetary policy in the context of health and education. What are the kind of expenditure policies? that happen in the context of health and education, what are the different kinds of taxes that are imposed on people based on which we uh, earn resources or generate revenues that is then spent back on health and uh, education is a very important area of uh, research and discussion in the context of uh, public intervention. So, what are the major functions of budgetary policy? There are basically three main functions, allocation function, distribution function and the stabilization function. Now, what is an allocation function? The allocation function basically refers to provision of social goods or processes by which total resource use is divided between private and social goods and by which the mix of social goods is chosen. Now, in standard economic theory, anyone who is introduced to some basics of economics will know that we ta often talk about um, limited resources or resource constraints and because there are resource constraints, we have to make a choice between different uses of resources to what use the resources need to be put to. So, uh, if you recall the indifference curve analysis that we had studied and in that we had also uh, discussed about the production possibility uh, frontiers of the production possibility curve, we can now understand that there is a resource limit as far as countries are concerned and when there are resource limits and different bundles of goods and services need to be produced, let us say there are two different bundles of private goods and public goods and because uh, we are a, a mixed economy which requires both public goods and private goods to carry on our businesses, then it becomes important for the governments to decide through a budgetary process how much of resources need to be allocated for provision of public goods and how much of resources need to be allocated for the provision of social goods of, 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 of private goods. And this is what is referred to as the allocation function of the budgetary policy. Uh, second is distribution function. This basically requires adjustment of distribution of income and wealth uh, because of considerations of fairness and justice. And uh, in today's world where uh, we uh, live in uh, modern democratic societies, uh, where at least we try to bring down distinctions between caste and class and religion and race and so on and so forth. And we also understand the fact that there are historical discrimination that have been carried out against different sections of the population. So, therefore, it becomes then important for us to ensure that uh, there is fairness and justice with regard to distribution of resources because extreme poverty is, uh, is unacceptable and we then need to also assess that which are the sections of the population who are 
living amidst extreme poverty and whether the extreme poverty conditions have connections to historical discriminations. So, keeping in mind a social justice perspective, it is often important to also ensure that the budgetary policy has a distribution function with regard to distribution of resources. It can be income or different kinds of resources. Finally, there is a stabilization function of budget policy. This is basically the use of budget policy to maintain the macroeconomic aggregates, whether it is with respect to incomes or employment, interest rates, uh, price level stability, uh, appropriate rate of economic growth, uh, um, uh, foreign trade, balance of payments and so on and so forth. So, there are allocation function which tells us which the public sector indicates or the budgetary policy indicates with regard to which resources, limited resources of the economy of the country or limited incomes of the country should be spent on uh, which mix of uh, social good and private goods distribution function with regard to who should be provided how much and finally, stabilization function with regard to how the macroeconomic aggregates of the economy can be uh, properly uh, balanced. Now, let us uh, focus on uh, allocation function. Now, in the context of social goods, often we have seen that there are market inefficiencies. We will go into little more detail in uh, the next class on social goods and market failure in this module on uh, concept of externalities. But for now, let us understand that social goods or public goods give rise to market inefficiencies because markets cannot effectively uh, provide uh, social goods and public goods to all person to all uh, sections of the population because there is a cost consideration that cannot effectively be met by the private sector or the uh, when we say market we are referring to the private sector and therefore there is public provision for social goods i have just mentioned that it is a political process which is actually a substitute for the market mechanism in the context of the private sector when we say that the markets are providing goods and services people demand for different goods, people have a willingness to pay a price for the good, you are revealing your preference for the good as well as the price that you want to pay for the good. Similarly, the suppliers are selling the good, goods are available in the market, there is a price uh, uh, tag on the product or the service that you want to buy from the market and then depending upon the uh, price, uh, the, your willingness to pay, there is a trading of good that is taking place in the market. But in the context of social good, often people do not uh, reveal their preferences about the social good and therefore the pricing of the social good becomes a very important question uh, and this is where a uh, political process becomes a substitute for the market mechanism with regard to public provisioning of social goods. There are national uh, social goods and there are local social goods and public services provided by national versus local governments. For example, uh, the panchayat system is a local governance system, but the national government and there are state governments and there are district level governance systems also. So, uh, often you know there are goods that have to be provided at let us say a village level or a town level that is to be decided by the urban governance process or the rural governance process. But there are uh, goods such as national defense which is to be centrally decided. There are goods and services that are uh, specifically uh, designed and framed by the state governments in question. So, there are different levels of governments that can intervene to provide the kind of goods and services that is required. So, there can be national or local social goods and services. Now, there is a point about public provision versus public uh, production. Often we tend to talk about provision and production synonymously, but uh, for an economist when they are talking about uh, providing goods and services to the public sector, often there is a distinction made between public provision and public production. If we say that social goods are provided publicly, we mean that they are financed through the budget and made available free of direct charge. So, how they are produced then does not matter. Uh, when looking at the public sector in the national accounts, we will often see that the provision is divided equally between compensation paid to public employees and outputs that have been purchased from the private firms. This is to mean to say that when we say public provisioning of goods and services, 
the actual production of the goods and services may have taken place with the uh, involvement of the private sector. Provisioning of goods and services does not mean that there is no uh, participation of the private sector at all. Public provisioning of goods and services means that a certain good or service is provided through the budgetary process free of cost to the consumers. But on the production side, there is of course involvement of the private sector and there may be various kinds of subsidies and other kinds of um, transaction costs or there may be other kinds of contractual arrangements between the public sector and the private sector, which is uh, not what we should be concerned with now. Secondly, the distribution functions, uh, the distribution issues are a major and frequently the major point of controversy in a budget debate. In particular, they play a very important role in determination of tax and transfer policies and there are various determinants of distribution, what is the kind of distribution that needs to be made, who should be paid more or less. Uh, there, are, there can be regional distribution issues, there may be uh, social group based distribution issues, there may be um, gender based distribution issues uh, and so on and so forth. So, the determinants of distribution are varied and of course, there are varied differences in a diverse country, um, in diverse countries such as uh, ours. Uh, secondly, the issue of how income should be distributed, whether there should be direct cash transfer programs, whether there should be conditional cash transfers programs or there should be in-kind programs, whether there should be um, work for pay kind of programs and so on. These are all very important areas of discussion in the context of distribution measures in the intersection of uh, public economics and development economics and economics of health and education. And then finally, distribution policy does not uh, just exist, it takes place through fiscal instruments. So, the fiscal instruments of tax and expenditure or different kinds of uh, uh, transfer payments programs help us to decide what is the kind of distribution policy that is in place. In the context of distribution, we often talk about Pareto optimality. Pareto optimality is a desirable condition and what does it say? It says that uh, to put it very simply, a change in economic condition is said to be efficient or may, which means that it is welfare improving if and only if the position of some person say A is improved without that of anyone else including B and C being worsened. And this criterion can be qualified and amended in various ways. Uh, it cannot be applied to a redistributional measure which by definition improves A's position at the expense of B's and C's. Now, it must be understood that while this someone gains, no one loses rule has served well in assessing the efficiency of markets and of certain aspects of public policy, it contributes very little to solving the basic social issues of fair distribution. And much of these issues of fair distribution involves consideration of social philosophy and value judgment. And these are very important considerations in countries across the world. And uh, these are uh, a separate discussion in itself when it comes to distribution measures or redistributive measures with respect to various social goods and um, services. Now, there are two uh, major problems involved in the translation of a justice rule into an actual state of income distribution uh, that we can uh, point out in this uh, context. First is that it is difficult or impossible to compare the levels of utility which various individuals derive from their income. So, for example, a, a person who lives in a, a flood and a riverine area compared to a person who lives in a drought prone area or a dry region of the country, what is the utility that they associate with the incomes in their disposable incomes in their hands, it is very difficult to assess and also compare. So, there is no simple way of adding up utilities and so that criteria based on such comparisons are often not operational. And this limitation has led people to think in terms of social evaluation rather than subjective utility measurement. The other difficulty that arises in the translation of a justice rule into an actual state of income distribution is that the size of the pie or the size of the handout or the size of the benefit that is available for distribution is not unrelated to how it is to be distributed. One is it is to be distributed, but how it is to be distributed is a very important question and therefore, redistribution policies may involve an efficiency cost which has to be taken into account when one is deciding on the extent to which the equity objectives need to be pursued. 
in very plain and simple terms to be able to ensure social equity and justice it cannot simply be a comparison of utilities based upon income which conditions such as Pareto optimality um, we often discuss about Pareto optimality conditions in the context of economics but often when it comes to social policy evaluation or social goods distribution such kinds of principles does not translate into an actual state of income distribution and therefore we take recourse to various other kinds of evaluations in practice. Finally, the stabilization function of the budget policy, having dealt with the role of budget policy in matters of allocation and distribution, we must understand that the macro performance of the economy is also very important. That is, whether we have sufficient levels of employment or not, whether there is a reasonable degree of price level stability or we are victims of inflation or deflationary conditions, the soundness of our foreign accounts, whether we have balance of payments, what is the situation of our balance of payments, what is the trade deficit that we have and an acceptable rate of economic growth because economic growth while uh, excessive obsession with economic growth. Uh, without consideration of development and grow, uh, equity and justice is a problem in itself but not paying attention to the growth of the country, economic growth of the country may lead to various kinds of problems within the economy. So, achievement of these targets does not come about automatically but all of these require some kind of a policy guidance and without it the economy tends to be subject to substantial fluctuations and may suffer from various uh, kinds of economic problems such as unemployment, inflation, stagflation, hyperinflation and so on for a sustained period of time. And therefore, we have instruments of stabilization policy which are mostly monetary instruments or fiscal instruments. And as I have mentioned earlier, monetary instruments could be simply rates of interest within the economy and fiscal instruments falls largely within the broad canopy of uh, tax and expenditure policies. Now, so far what we have seen is there is a public sector, there is an importance of the public sector intervention when it comes to social goods and services. Now the public sector through the budgetary process, uh, through the uh, political process uh, of voting uh, brings about a budgetary policy and the budgetary policy has three important functions, the functions of allocation, distribution and stabilization. And all of these functions, all of these three functions have to be perfectly coordinated with each other. And based upon the coordination of these budgetary functions, usually we either have an expansionary policy or we have a contractionary fiscal policy. So, let us now pay some attention to what are expansionary fiscal policies and what are contractionary fiscal policies. Now, you must learners understand here that we are discussing uh, this because we want to provide a framework, a background how the policies regarding education and health can be understood in the context of public economics or where public sector intervention is extremely important for the provision of goods and services such as health and education. So, what is an expansionary policy? Uh, a fiscal policy which is aimed at stimulating economic growth uh, implemented by increasing government expenditure, uh, decreasing taxes or reducing the burden of taxes or a combination of both is what is referred to as an expansionary fiscal policy. And this type of policy is usually employed during periods of economic recession or slow economic growth to boost aggregate uh, demand create more and more jobs and encourage consumer and business spending. Now, let us also look at some of the instruments of expansionary budget policies. Government spending and tax cuts are two important instruments of uh, expansionary budget policy. And uh, what does uh, these uh, uh, instruments usually imply or lead to? For example, government spending might involve uh, investments in very big infrastructure projects like roads, bridges, schools, hospitals and other public works to create jobs and stimulate demand. Now, you must have realized that when we say uh, increasing government spending and long term investments in infrastructure or schools and hospitals, uh, effectively we are talking about investments in social goods such as schooling and um, health, uh, education and health and so on. Similarly, increased government spending on public services, education, health care, social services, they directly support the economy and has long term benefits or uh, intergenerational uh, benefits uh, that uh, usually the private competition will put a very uh, heavy uh, discount value on. 
but the government sector will put a low discount value on because of its um, future benefits. Subsidies and grants providing financial support to specific industries or sectors to promote growth and development in the uh, short run leading to long term benefits is another um, area of government spending. Similarly, there can be tax cuts, it can be income tax reductions, corporate tax reductions or tax credits and deductions. So, lowering personal income taxes will increase disposable income for households and therefore encourage higher consumption spending leading to uh, more and more spending and therefore production of goods and services uh, in the long run. Uh, similarly, reducing taxes on businesses to increase their profitability and incentivizing investment and expansion can be one of the ways of um, expansionary budget policy. Offering credits or deductions for certain activities such as R&D or energy efficient investments also promotes specific kinds of economic behavior that are uh, expansionary in nature. Uh, there can also be uh, transfer payments. Uh, now, these transfer payments can be of various kinds. Broadly, we can think of unemployment benefits and social security benefits. So, increasing unemployment benefits to those out of work or maintaining their purchasing power and stabilizing demand is one of the important instruments of expansionary policies. Expanding social security and welfare programs to provide financial assistance to vulnerable population is also an expansionary policy. Similarly, hiring more and more people for government jobs, increasing the number of public sector jobs to reduce unemployment and increase household uh, income or public sector employment is also an expansionary policy that leads to uh, overall increase in aggregate uh, demand in the economy. So, what are the objectives of expansionary budget policy? Mainly four, one is increased aggregate demand by boosting uh, expenditure and reducing taxes, uh, expansionary policy aims to increase the overall demand in the economy. Uh, secondly, reduce unemployment by creating jobs directly through government policies, projects or indirectly through increased business activity, the policy aims to lower unemployment rate and then there can be encouragement of investment. So, lower taxes and increased government spending can create a more favorable environment to private sector investment and promote economic growth. But of course, any kind of budgetary policy has risks and considerations. In the context of expansionary budgetary policy, there are three main risks. One is inflation, second is budgetary deficits and crowding out of private investment. So, uh, in the case of inflation, if the economy is already operating at full capacity or full employment equilibrium, then expansionary policies can lead to inflationary pressures. Similarly, increasing government spending and uh, equivalently uh, or um, uh, simultaneously reduction of uh, taxes can lead to budgetary deficits and very high public debt. Crowding out of uh, private investment is an important uh, fallout of expansionary policies as well. Now, let us move to what are contractionary policies. So, a fiscal policy which is aimed at reducing economic activity to control inflation, stabilize an overheated economy or reduce government deficits is a contractionary policy. So, this type of policy is typically implemented by uh, decreasing government spending, increasing taxes or a combination of both and the primary goal is to decrease aggregate demand. So, cool down the economy and prevent excessive inflation. What are the instruments? The opposite of expansionary policies. So, you have reduction in government spendings by cutting down on public projects, decreasing public services, reducing subsidies and grants to specific industries and sectors. Similarly, uh, increase income taxes, corporate taxes, eliminate uh, tax credits and uh, deductions. So, reduce the disposable income in the hands of households and uh, which will eventually reduce consumer spending. Similarly, increasing taxes on businesses, reduce their profitability which may slow down business expansion and investments and so on. So, uh, also reduction in transfer payments, lower unemployment benefits, cut down on social security and welfare programs, lowering unemployment benefits, uh, it will reduce the amount or duration of unemployment benefits to decrease government spending and encourage job seeking. Uh, public sector uh, freeze on employment, hiring freezes and layoffs, implementing hiring uh, freezes or reducing the number of public sector jobs to lower government payroll expenses. Now, what we are seeing in the context of expansionary policies and contractionary policies are the two extremes 
of uh, what they can lead to. But often, governments across the world balance between expansionary and contractionary policies and therefore, there is a coordination of uh, allocation, distribution and stabilization functions to be able to have the right mix of expansionary and contractionary policy because nobody wants to have these extremes in any economy. The objectives of contractionary budget policy are primarily for control inflation, stabilize an overheated economy, uh, prevent bubbles and ensure uh, sustainable growth, reduce budget deficits by decreasing spending and increasing revenue and this policy also aims to reduce government budget deficits and public debt and promote long term fiscal stability by ensuring that government finances are sustainable in the long run. As I said, any kind of extreme contractionary policy or expansionary policy has its risks and consideration. In the case of contractionary policy, it may give rise to economic slowdown because it can lead to a slowdown of economic growth and cause a recession if not carefully managed. Similarly, it might increase unemployment. Uh, government spending and increasing taxes can lead to unemployment rates as businesses and households adjust to lower demand. There may be public discontent. Uh, public dissatisfaction and social unrest because of cuts in public services and benefits as well as increased higher taxes. It may also impact the vulnerable populations uh, gravely uh, due to reductions in social security and welfare programs and it can have disproportionate effect on the low income and vulnerable uh, groups of population. So, by now we have discussed uh, two important uh, uh, aspects of public sector. One is the what is the public sector, uh, why uh, size of the public sector is uh, not uh, really an ideological issue but a technical issue and uh, we have also discussed what are the limitations arising out of market inefficiencies because of which government intervention or the existence of public sector becomes very important and we have also seen what is the public sector and the private sector perception towards uh, investments in the long run and the short run. And um, we looked at the budgetary uh, processes of allocation, distribution and stabilization function and how coordination of these three functions gives rise to uh, the coordination between expansionary policies and contractionary policies. I have also introduced to the learners in this lesson about what is an expansionary policy and a contractionary policy. Now, we move to the second part of this lesson. In the second part, we will um, get introduced to somewhat a definition of what is a public good. We have so far been listening about public good and private good. Now, there are two important uh, characteristics, at least that is how economists have come to understand that there are two basic characteristics of a public good. One is it is non-exclusive and second is it is non-rival. So, what does non-exclusiveness means? It means that no one can be excluded from the benefits of a, a public good. Once a public good is provided, everybody can have access to the public good. In the case of private good, if I am buying a good, I am excluding everybody else from taking benefits out of that good because I have established a property right over that good. So, let us say I am buying an iPhone, I have paid for the iPhone and therefore, it is my private property and it is uh, automatically excludes everybody else from claiming that as their iPhone. But in the case of a public good, let us say that we are walking on a road and there is a street light which is providing uh, me the benefit of uh, um, uh, light. Uh, so, it is a good that has been provided, it is a public good that has been provided and um, I may have paid for it out of my taxes, but I cannot exclude others from uh, getting the benefit of that good irrespective of whether or not they have paid for that good through taxes or not. So, that is what non-exclusivity refers to. A public good is non-exclusive in nature or non-excludable in nature. Sometimes we use the term non-excludable. So, no one can be excluded from the benefits of a public good. Similarly, it is also non-rival which means that the consumption by one does not um, exclude or preclude consumption by others. Often we take the example of food items, let us say a pizza for which I have paid for and it is uh, extremely rival in nature because first I have paid for it, I have uh, claimed a property right over it which means that it is my uh, piece of pizza which means I can exclude you from consuming it. But secondly, once I have consumed it, it is not available for you because I have consumed it. So, it is uh, rival in nature. 
whereas public goods are non rival in nature because if i am utilizing the benefit of a good it is equally available for someone else uh, for utilizing the same example of street light can be considered here so many goods provided by the government have public good aspects to them example street lights public parks roads national highways and so on and there are uh, so no pure public goods per se but national defense is the closest example of a pure public good where irrespective of who pays for it or not through the process of taxes of course uh, gets defended by national defense um, the uh, amount of expenditure that is made by the government on national defense it is for each and every citizen of the country so that's the closest example of what can a pure public good look like now once a pure public good or a public good is supplied to one individual it is simultaneously supplied to all in the next class we will look at what is the marginal cost of provision of a public good but we'll keep it for later now we will only understand we will look at a conceptual clarity between a public good and a private good so once a pure public good is supplied to an individual it is simultaneously supplied to all which means that it is non excludable you cannot exclude anybody else from uh getting the benefits of that public good so the social benefit of a public good usually we try to um when we say um benefit derived uh from a private good consumption we talk about demand curve similarly in the context of social goods or public goods when we say the social benefit of a public good also we look at a demand curve but there is a difference in the demand curve of privately demanded goods and services and socially demanded goods and services or publicly demanded goods and services the social benefit of a public good uh, shown in the form of a demand curve is the sum of individual benefits value on the vertical axis it is vertically summed up so what does vertical summation mean let us say we want to uh, come up with a valuation of a market valuation of a public good and we know that a public good is enjoyed by many people without diminishing in value so we are showing a quantity on the horizontal axis here and price on the vertical axis here so let us say there is an individual a and his uh, demand curve is uh, shown as a downward sloping demand curve when the individual is consuming one unit of this good he is paying uh, let us say 0.5 uh, dollars for it and when he is consuming 3 uh, units of the good the individual is paying somewhere around uh, 0.1 dollars of the uh, good now let us see there is an individual uh, b um, and the individual b is paying a slightly higher price for one unit of the good in the case of uh, one unit of good earlier the individual a was paying about 0.5 dollars but individual b has paid 0.6 dollars Uh, similarly uh, for 3 units of good individual a had paid around 0.1 dollars but individual b is paying uh, somewhere around uh, 0.4 dollars uh, for 3 units of the good now when we look at market demand curve here we have to look at a vertical summation meaning that we uh, add up the prices here so 0.5 plus 0.6 which is 1.10 dollars is what is paid for the provision of one unit of this uh, public good and similarly for three units of the public good the demand made by individual a and b is vertically summed up to be able to come up with the uh, market demand or market value of a public good now often we will say that in the case of public good uh the revealing of preferences is very important whether or not suppose there is a park that needs to come up in the vicinity of our neighborhood now there are 100 people living in the vicinity in the neighborhood and everyone uh, benefits from the utility that the park provides but who is willing to pay how much for the provision of the park unless it's a private park unless it's a society park which uh, society members may be compelled to pay for the park but if it's a public park which is provided by the government although everybody needs uh, knows that they can draw a utility out of the park um, uh, in terms of the benefits that is being provided but not all individuals will reveal their preferences about how much they want to pay for that good and uh, suppose let us say there are uh, groups of individuals who are uh, willing to uh, reveal their preferences about how much they wa want to pay for that good 
uh, a person may be willing to pay more another person may be willing to pay less uh, depending upon their personal valuation of how much that park should cost but irrespective of whoever is paying whatever the government provides for the good so it is in this sense that we talk about public goods the market valuation of a public good is a vertical summation of all uh, of uh, prices uh, that the uh, individuals are willing to pay whereas in the case of private goods it's a horizontal summation of all prices that the individuals are willing to pay so now this issue of excludability is important in the context of costs of pricing so often the public and private good differentiation is not very clear and there are various goods and services that fall very close to uh, each other in the differentiation with respect to public good and private good but economists prefer to classify goods according to their degree of rivalry and excludability now this matrix here will help us understand this better so you see in this matrix there are uh, four blocks uh, towards the left hand side uh, on the top panel it shows us the uh, degree of rivalness in consumption rival non rival so in the extreme right uh, it is uh, non rival or 0% rival on the extreme left is rival and on the vertical axis we see the degree of excludability in the lower part it is uh, non excludable in the upper part it is 100% excludable so let us look at the first box apple in the matrix here so an apple is a private good because you pay for the good and therefore you make so so it is 100% excludable somebody else can be excluded from uh, claiming uh, right over the apple because uh, someone else has paid for it and also it is rival because once consumed it is not available for somebody else but if you look at a uh, fish in the ocean it is rival uh, to a large extent because there are limits to how much uh, fishing we can do in water bodies so in that sense there is some degree of rivalry there but it is completely non excludable because if one has access to uh, the fish in the water body someone else may also have access to it now if we look at the other extreme uh, encoded uh, radio broadcast for example it is uh, the degree of excludability is high uh, but it is non rival in nature because if the radio broadcast can be accessed by someone it can also be accessed by someone else but you can always put a price on it by encoded uh, radio broadcast and therefore you can exclude people from having access to the broadcast general r&d is uh, taken as an example of a uh, uh, public good here where uh, general r&d let us say contributes to provision of some kind of social good for the benefit of everyone let us say general research and development which gives rise to the uh, polio vaccine now uh, this information the general research and development that is carried out for polio vaccination should be freely available to all because it has huge social benefits a polio free society is beneficial for every uh, citizen of the country so therefore it is put uh, in a place where it is non rival as well as non excludable if somebody has access to uh, polio vaccines or for that matter covid vaccination any kind of infectious disease vaccinations are also examples of um, non rivalness because access to that good actually uh, benefits another person from being able to uh, get infected by the infectious disease so economists prefer to classify goods according to their degree of rivalry and excludability if a good is both excludable and rival it's a case of a pure public good if a good is uh, non rival and non excludable uh, is 100% non rival and 100% non excludable it is surely a case of uh, public good but often we see that there is publicness and privateness characteristics in all kinds of goods and services and therefore we operate somewhere in the middle there may be goods which are uh, non excludable uh, but rival in nature there may be goods which are non rival but excludable in nature and so on and so forth so uh, health and education also have unique characteristics of both publicness and privateness i have um, uh, discussed in one of the classes where basic education or primary education can be considered as a public good because a primary education gives rise to creation of minimum capabilities which uh, benefits not just the individual who has received education but also uh, positively benefits 
other sections of the society from the education that one has received. Similarly, access to primary health care facilities are surely a case of public good because access to primary health facilities or uh, medicines for uh, infectious diseases, for example, are surely in the area of public goods. However, elective surgeries are private goods. Similarly, access to professional education or very high levels of education can surely be categorized as private goods and so on and so forth. Okay, so there are informational problems that gives rise to uh, various kinds of um, regulations. I have, uh, I have taken just a few examples here. Uh, perfectly competitive markets assume perfect information. We have seen this in the very first module of this course. But in the real world, buyers and sellers do not usually have equal information and there is information asymmetry. So, there is a problem of adverse selection in the case of uh, uh, information asymmetry and under conditions of uh, information asymmetry often signaling can offset some of the information problems. Uh, signaling basically refers to an action taken by an informed party that reveals information to an uninformed party that offsets the false signal that caused the adverse selection in the first place. So, often in the case of information asymmetries or unequal information, some kind of signaling can be uh, used as a regulation mechanism to deal with uh, problems of information. So, selling a used car may provide a false signal to the buyer that the car is a lemon, but if the false signal can be offset by a warranty of uh, 2, 3 years and so on, then the problem can be dealt with adequately. In the context of uh, health, we have seen that uh, the licensing of doctors uh, is an important uh, policy that deals with informational problem. We know that medical care is an example of imperfect information and patients usually do not have a way of knowing if a doctor is capable enough and the current practice is to require medical licenses to establish a minimum level of competency. Another option is to provide the public with information on grades in medical school, success rate for various procedures, charges and fees, uh, references from other uh, patients and doctors or uh, people in the family and so on. So, this is an example of how information uh, problems can be uh, dealt with through a policy decision uh, in markets which uh, in which there are information asymmetries. Now, the role of governments in economics, uh, uh, they play basically two economic functions. One is, uh, and we are discussing this in the context of this distinction between public goods and private goods. One is they enforce property rights and provide legitimate means for redistribution of income and wealth. And second is non-market allocation of resources when markets fail. And markets are said to fail when they allocate resources inefficiently so that too much of some goods and too few of others are uh, produced. Now, let me uh, end this lesson with the rationale for why this dichotomy between public goods and private goods is important in the context of health and education. We need to study this dichotomy between public and private goods uh, uh, because it helps us to understand the nature of these goods and informs policy decisions regarding the provisioning, financing and regulation. For example, we have just seen in the case of licensing of doctors which provides a signal to the patients who are uninformed about who to choose. Now, this is a case, this is a pure case of where uh, uh, markets fail, but uh, the market failure can be corrected if the governments intervene in the form of licensing of doctors. So, it is a, uh, health is a public good, uh, getting benefits out of health is, uh, has publicness characteristics which means that it is non-rival in many cases, it could also be non-excludable, but also the fact that there is information asymmetry, if the government steps in and intervenes by saying, by providing some kind of a signaling to the patients that look here is a licensed doctor who has uh, graduated from a good uh, medical school, a government medical school uh, with all the um, required examinations or uh, grades uh, etc. in place, then probably the patient in the market will have enough confidence to be able to approach the doctor for uh, his or her medication and so on and so forth. So, this is an example of why it is important for us to understand this dichotomy between public goods and private goods and the nature of these goods because this helps us to inform policy decisions regarding their provisioning, financing and regulation. 
characteristics and allocation uh, it is important uh, that uh, we understand the characteristics of public goods and private goods because it, it helps the government for uh, coming up with a proper mix of social goods and private goods and therefore it fulfills the allocation functions of the budgetary policy. Health and education services often have characteristics of public goods such as non-excludability and non-rivalry. For example, public health initiatives like vaccinations benefit the entire community and basic education can uplift societal literacy and productivity. So, it is in this context that the dichotomy uh, helps us to determine what should be the allocation of the good. Similarly, certain health and education services can be considered private goods where individuals can be excluded for use if they do not pay and consumption by one person can reduce availability for others such as private tutoring or elective medical procedures. So, here again the distinction between the characteristics of goods is very important. Similarly, uh, the dichotomy is important for understanding optimal provision. Whether a good is public or private helps us to determine the appropriate level of government intervention. Public goods often require government provision or subsidies because the markets may under provide them due to the free rider problem. We will do this in the next class. In contrast, private goods can be efficiently provided by the market. We have uh, discussed in some detail about equity and access. There are equity considerations particularly with respect to health and uh, education. Access to basic health services is a fundamental right and public provision ensures that even the poorest segments of the society receive essential health care. Similarly, public education promotes equal opportunity ensuring that every child regardless of their socioeconomic background has access to quality education. And markets may fail to provide health and education services efficiently and equitably. So, public goods characteristics can lead to underinvestment in these sectors if left solely to the market and therefore, it necessitates government intervention to ensure adequate provision and access. So, um, with this I end the, this lesson, uh, but just a very quick summary of what we have done in today's lesson. In today's lesson, we have introduced uh, uh, the learners to uh, two important uh, aspects of um, the module of externalities. One is the um, existence of the public sector or the need for governments to intervene. Uh, often we equate uh, the existence of public sector with government intervention. We have seen that uh, there are uh, certain limitations of the market mechanism because of inefficiencies, which is why it becomes important for government sectors to intervene. Uh, we have uh, looked at two, three very important uh, aspects of uh, government intervention. For example, what is the private sector perception? Uh, to uh, current consumption, what is the public sector perception to current consumption. We have looked up the example of national monopolies which often requires the presence of a huge uh, public sector or the government sector and um, we have also seen that when markets uh, become inefficient, uh, the market process is supplemented or um, uh, is supplemented by a uh, political process of uh, budgetary um, of budget policy and this budgetary policy has three important functions. We have seen that there is an allocation function, there is a distribution function, there is a stabilization function and all of these functions have to be coordinated uh, uh, well. There has to be a balanced coordination of all of these functions to be able to come up with the right mix of expansionary and contractionary policy and the right mix of expansionary and contractionary policy is important for the macroeconomic aggregate such as unemployment, income and so on and so forth. We have also seen how uh, economists understand the distinction between public goods and private goods. We have seen that the degree of excludability and the degree of rivalriness between two goods helps us to distinguish between uh, these two different kinds of goods. We have also seen what is the rationale for distinguishing between public goods and private goods. The rationale is mostly with respect to what should be the optimal provision of these goods, who should intervene, how should they intervene and how should the goods and services be provided is a very important area of concern and discussion in uh, the context of um, what we are studying in this course. So, much of this uh, uh, materials that I have discussed in this course have been taken from various textbooks on public economics and economics of health and education. I have mentioned the uh, references in uh, uh, some of the previous uh, uh, lessons in the previous weeks 
and uh, those uh, textbooks can be referred to by the interested learners. Thank you. I will see you in the next class.